Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, if you'll please rise, I have asked Supervisor Gould to lead us in the invocation and Supervisor Johnson to lead us in the pledge. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day, Lord, and we thank you for the responsibility that you've given us here to run the county. We ask that you watch over our employees and keep them safe as they go out because many of them have dangerous jobs. And we ask that all our employees and all the people gathered here today go home safely to the loving arms of their family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, before I start the meeting, I just wanted to thank everyone here in Lake Havasu. I, there, I know that there are elected officials here. I didn't get a list. I don't want to leave anyone out, so I'm just going to do a blanket thank you to all of the uh, elected city council members and the workers in Lake Havasu City for allowing us to use this beautiful office for our meeting. And um, it's now is our policy to um, take this show on the road. So we will be here again, I'm sure. So I wanted to thank you again. Okay, I need a motion to call for an executive session to be held on November 4th, 2019 at 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal counsel in accordance with ARS 38-431.03. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I need a, mo a motion and action to approve waiving the reading in full of items presented for discussion, adoption, or approval at this meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, then now we're on to the official business to come before this board. Discussion of pending or contemplated litigation claims and demands. Mr. Esplin. Nothing to report to the board, thank you. That's it, okay. Committee and or legislative reports. We go around and ask each supervisor if they have one this morning, and we will start with Supervisor Watson. Thank you, Chairman. Nothing this morning. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I attended the workforce development meeting in Parker, along with uh, Supervisor Bishop, was also there. We discussed uh, the positives that we have in our area and the negatives also, which is always good to take a look at. But it's important that we put our folks to work, and this allows us to use uh, federal money that comes down to the, the area for employment development. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Bishop, you have anything to add? Yes, Supervisor Gold spoke for me. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> we had a Quad State Local Government Authority meeting. We went over the progress being made on historic roads, right of ways, RS-2477 legislation in the 116th Congress. Since the House leadership has changed, it has required them to continue to push for legislation by gaining support from the Democrat side of the aisle. Um, we have gained some support from Utah and Arizona, but we're still working to get support from our member from Central Nevada. It can be a House bill and carry it to the Senate. There we have both parties. Uh, lined up in the Senate to co-sponsor a bill that would support the legislation. Uh, we had a report on PILT and SRS funding. Congress has, has embraced PILT at $500 million per year, although Congress has reauthorized SRS for FY17 and FY18. They have not reauthorized the program for 19 and beyond, so counties rely on on the SRS payments to provide the numerous critical services that are going to be heard if it doesn't get reauthorized. Uh, we also had a report and discussion on what's going on in D.C. Um, it's quiet, not much transpiring, at least on the natural resources area. Legislation is in bad shape because of the impeachment partisan divide. Fish and Wildlife has produced rules that have caused the environmentalist groups some uh, heartburn. Some of the changes are very beneficial. Regulations imposed are what is needed and would not adversely affect the endangered species. The Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA jointly announced revisions to regulations that implement portions of the Endangered Species Act. No environmental take is being uh, put into the incidental take, so we're, that's good news for us. Environmentalists are filing suit against the new wildlife rules. 
We'll see more rulemaking. Western Congress has introduced a bunch of bills. Federal wildlife laws will not be coming in this Congress. Senate passed appropriation bill that excluded funding for moving the BLM headquarters. Interior has some new appointments, but all of them have been for short periods of time where the appointees leave rather uh, quickly. Perry Penley is now the acting BLM director, but Steve, but doesn't we don't feel that he will be confirmed due to the past involvement with public lands and attorney for clients that have challenged BLM and other federal land agencies management actions. Uh, Mr. Penley has recused himself from communicating with a 17 page list of people and organizations that he has been involved with as an attorney. Uh, Ariella Skipworth was nominated to be the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. However, there have been some concerns that she is not qualified for the job. Daniel Dorden has been confirmed as solicitor of the Department of Interior, but is controversial with some changes uh, to the Freedom of Information Act that he, is, he was behind. Rob Wallace, Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife, um, we're very hopeful that he will get in. Todd Willens is Chief of Staff for Bernhardt. Uh, he really knows the ESA. He should be an ally. We talked about the lawsuit that is pending, the 60-day notice for filing on listing of the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. The data does not support listing the population, and the lawsuit that is filed by the environmental groups in early September does not have any firm information that result in listing the species. Uh, we'll stand by on that. I believe that's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have one thing to add. I am thrilled to report that after five years of trying, every time an appointment comes up, which is several times a year, Susan McAlpine from Kingman has been appointed to the Wild Horse and Burrow National Advisory Board. That is a very, very important board. Um, thanks. <laughs> and um, I think she's very up to the task. She wants everyone to know that she's been appointed as a humane advocate for our wild horses and burrows and will be carefully balance issues, problem resolution, proposals, and what she feels is humane, cost effective, and in their best interest. So um, in case you don't know, Mojave County has the largest wild burrow population in the country. And this is the first time we've had a representative from Arizona. A lot of people worked hard on this board um, in, and in Washington to make this happen. So that's how important it is. Not, I believe the first meeting she'll be at is at the end of this month, and I will invite her to our first meeting in November to give us a report. So if that's what you're interested in, please tune in. Okay, uh, that's all I have. How about a county administrator's report? I have no report today, Madam Chairman, okay. but thank you. Uh, I need a motion for the approval of the September 16th Board of Supervisors meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now it's time for the call to public, so I'm going to open up the call to public. Those wishing to address the board at the call to the public regarding matters not on the board agenda must fill out and submit to the clerk a call to the public request to speak form located in the back of the room prior to the meeting. Pursuant to ARS 38 4310H, a 1H, a public body may make an open call to the public during a public meeting, subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions to allow individuals to address the public body on any issue within the jurisdiction of the public body. At the conclusion of an open call to the public, individual members of the body may respond to criticisms made by those who have addressed the public body, may ask staff to review a matter, or may ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. However, members of this public body shall not discuss or take legal action on matters raised during an open call to the public unless the matters are properly noticed for discussion and legal action. I did have two people signed up. This is the form if you still wish to sign up, but I'll ask after this if anyone still wants to speak. But first up, we have Mary Van Roy. Because I think when people look at your agenda, 
<laughs> and um, anyway, it's great that you're here. I, and I, I want to compliment that Susan McAlpine, I've ridden horses with her, so I'm really glad to hear that news. Um, I'm here because I wanted to thank the board for our Donkey Acres Trail, which is Horizon 6 Improvement District. Um, that was really important to our community. The kids walk to school, bus stops through it. Um, they, people walk their dogs. Of course, for us equestrians, it's a safe trail to get to the public lands. So that's been really good. And because of that experience and getting the grant from State Parks and Trails, I've been on the advisory board for the non-motorized trails. And of course, State Parks and Trails has funding from the federal government for more grants. And I know um, Dolan Springs has had some. And again, without the county, city MPO, and so much help, it'd be hard to get these things done. And um, I guess what I'm hoping for is that someday more funding is available for, I know in Kingman, the Wallapais, if people from Havas who haven't been to the Wallapais, it's a beautiful park up there. And then I guess Bullhead has Davis Dam. And Mojave Valley, they have so much public-private parks and buildings and things they've done for the community. And I guess my whole point is that families and residents of Mojave County deserve as much public recreational opportunities at, at no cost or low cost so that the family, it's a healthy environment and it's a good thing to do. And we spend our summers up in the cool country and people say, well, we're not Maricopa County, we're not Coconino County. But um, they did vote, and this was a public vote that the people put, proposed in 2002, and it's called CPOS, Coconino County Parks and Open Space Program. And that allowed the county to build parks and the acquisition of land for public use. It was a one-eighth of one cent sales tax that concluded in 2014. It was passed by 61% of the voters. So maybe if enough people came forward and actually tried to do something like that, that would be great. Um, you know, other ways is trying to get these grants and, and, and ways of making our parks even better and more opportunity for recreation. So I was hoping to get the public interested and wanting to move forward on some of the great ideas that we have and we have Great Sarah Park, and we're very lucky to have as much opportunity as we have for recreation, but there's never enough, and families and, and people for their health and their... Being out in nature is the best thing you can do for kids and, and families, so thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, our county treasurer, Cindy Landa-Cox. Good morning, Madam Treasurer. Uh, Treasurer, yeah. <laughs> Madam Chairman, I was trying to be all Robert's rules and stuff. <laughs> Madam Chairman, Board, uh, staff, and Lake Havasu, yay. Thank you. Thank you for letting us come up here. I'm really excited it's here. I, I just wanted to say before I start this whole thing, I know that this isn't like, you know, the Cindy show or anything, but I now own a place as of last month in Lake Havasu. Yeah. Okay, I'm really excited. I paid my taxes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time. I'm kind of excited in Lake Havasu. So next, Bullhead City. Okay, I'm working on it. All right. Um, 2019 property taxes were mailed. The statements were mailed in September. And as a reminder, first half is due for real and personal property now. It is delinquent as of November 1st. There are some other except, except, excepts. If you'd like to see those on my website, please. Go to mojavecounty.us and it explains all of the rules around how you can pay property taxes and when they're due. There are some um, changes that happened during legislation. This in 2019, on May 3rd, 2019, the governor of Arizona signed Senate Bill 1033 into law, which changes how property taxes are billed to property owners with mortgage mortgaged property. So in the past what happened was anyone that had a mortgaged property that paid into an escrow fund that paid their property taxes, if you called and you said, can I have a property tax statement, you would get one in, in we would send one to you because it said may, on, upon request, I shall give you a property tax bill. Well now the law says I shall, period. You don't have to ask for it. So that cost our county about $60,000 I had to put in the budget. I don't know, don't know what the actual costs are yet because we haven't gotten the bill yet. But that was done 
for a transparency issue apparently that a constituent or constituents or many had in our county that wanted to see the bill. Although it's been available on the web and anytime you wanted you could ask for it, now I legally have to send it to you so you will get a bill. But if your property taxes are paid through your mortgage, please don't pay me because if you pay me and then your mortgage pays me, I have to then give it back to the mortgage company and you have to call them when you call my office and I have to tell you to go to your mortgage company and get the money back from them. So don't pay it unless you really owe it. And the only way to find that out is to call whoever your mortgage holder is. Okay, there, we're done with that. So our satellite offices in Lake Havasu City and Bullhead during the week of October 28th through November 1st will be open. And the office locations and times are on our website, mojavecounty.us, under Treasury, and I believe that they are on the front page as well. So I hope to uh, see some of you down here and up here. I'm not sure. I'm really directionally challenged. So that's my, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for letting me have the time. Oh, our pleasure. Okay, there's no... One else signed up, but I will open it up if anybody wants their three minutes. Yes, sir. Just give your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Jason West with the local Bureau of Land Management office. I just wanted to say hi this morning. Thank you for coming to Lake Havasu. I did send you an email with uh, current projects that are ongoing in our office. Please feel free to stop by with any questions, concerns, or comments, and we'd love to include you in everything that we're doing. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Come to our office uh, uh, if you have any questions for us, concerns, or anything that you'd like us to work on. We're absolutely available for you. And I just want to point out this is my public affairs specialist, Valerie Golke. And so uh, we're here and available for you at, at your beck and call. Thank you for letting me stand up. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Come on down. Good morning, uh, David Burnett, Lake Havasu City. I wanted to thank the board, uh, board for coming to Lake Havasu for the rotating thing. Thank you very much. And I also wanted to thank you guys for work on the Peace Trail. Uh, I think Buster was heading that up. Um, no? Well, anyway, thank you very <laughs> much. I was looking forward to it and taking a ride on it. So uh, again, thank you for the rotating um, schedule. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I see the mayor is here. I don't know if you were here earlier when I did a blanket thank you for everything. Is there anything you'd like to say? <laughs> Good morning, members of the board. Again, my name is Cal Sheehy, mayor of Lake Havasu City. Welcome to Lake Havasu. We're so glad to be hosting you. Uh, we uh, showed up for you, so we appreciate you being here and conducting uh, uh, the business here in Lake Havasu. We obviously believe uh, government closest to the people is the most effective, and we thank you for coming out to our community. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, last call. Okay, then I'm going to close the call to public. The next on our agenda is a proclamation. Um, before I get to that, is there anyone here from Mojave Electric that is going to speak? Uh, Artie Loxman's not going to be here today? No. Okay. So you guys are prepared to speak. So I asked, um, this proclamation is the adoption of a proclamation in support of Mojave Electric Cooperative Broadband Initiative in bringing service to rural communities in Mojave County Electric Cooperative Service Area. So b before we go and talk about that, I, I just wanted someone from MEC to explain to everybody what this is about. Thank you. I'm Rick Campos, the Chief Operating Officer for Mojave Electric Cooperative. And so let me just give you a little history about this project. So we've been asked by consumers, our members of the cooperative, what can you do to bring reliable, fast, high-speed broadband to our communities? A lot of our area is rural, and so there's not really good coverage in, in a lot of those areas. So what we did is we went and we did a, a website survey of our members. And we got really great results. Out of those people that responded, over 95% of those 
said they would take service if Mojave Electric were to provide it. So then we went to the next step. That was a feasibility study. So we knew we had interest. We listened to our members. The feasibility study went through, and we presented it to our board of directors. They liked the idea. They voted for us to move forward with this. So where we are today is we're seeking letters of support. We're seeking proclamations like, like today from the Board of Supervisors. We've received one from the uh, Bullhead City Council. We're looking for letters of support to, to help us overcome an obstacle of funding. So we need to send in for not only loan applications, but also for grant applications because we know what the cost is gonna be for the project, but we also like to keep in mind that we're a not-for-profit cooperative, so we want to also utilize what we have available, whether it's a, a USDA grant or it's the state of Arizona grant, we wanna be able to show that the community is behind this type of project. Uh, we also know that this is gonna be really great for Mojave County because it's gonna, it's gonna really spur uh, economic development in these areas. So we believe that by drawing more businesses, more residents, keeping and retaining our youth here with these types of broadband services, it's crucial for us to move forward with it. So that's why we're here today, uh, seeking this proclamation from the Board of Supervisors to help us with our broadband project. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I just have one. Where exactly, um, what customer base would be serviced by this MEC? Well, currently our, our study is focused on all of our members. So everywhere that Mojave Electric serves energy, that would be our primary focus. It's not to say that it can't grow out past that point, but at this point we're focused just on the cooperative service area. Okay, well thank you very much. Okay, well the proclamation is in backup. I, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna read it. It's exactly, it's a support letter, a proclamation like this gentleman talked about. So at this time, if there's no discussion, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve. I'll check the motion. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up is our consent agenda. The consent agenda items 5 through 30 will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion minus any items pulled for discussion. Supervisor Johnson. Supervisor Bishop. I have none. Supervisor Gould. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, number nine, please. Number nine. Supervisor Watson. Madam Chairman, I have none. None. Today. Very good. Okay, so I need a motion to approve agenda items numbers five through 30 minus number nine. So moved. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, on to number nine. A nine is to approve a change order number 31 to the original contract for the Serbot landfill in the amount of $271,728.96 for the purpose of relocating the Serbot landfill office, scale house, transfer station, and yard, as well as acquisition of a new scale and other related required equipment and establishing access from the landfill property boundary to the site and disposal areas and construction of any required drainage improvements. This is development services. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Walsh, can you give us an overview of what work is going on at the Servat landfill? Absolutely. Uh, Chairman Angus, Supervisor Gould, what this change order does is it allows our contractor out there to relocate the, uh, the, the office building that's currently in, uh, in between Two, two cells that we've constructed over the years. Uh, our our uh, proposal that was uh, basically what, what's going to be mo moving forward is cell six that we have planned and approved through ADEQ is to be constructed in, in between these two uh, hills, these two cells that have already been constructed. So this proposal basically moves the office, the scale house and all of that equipment out of the proposed cell six so that that can be constructed and, and, uh, and move forward. Uh, it moves uh, the office and every and all of the related uh, items outside of that area and over to the side so that the uh, the landfill can can uh, continue uh, business there. So there's no other cell that we can work on without relocating the office and the scales. This this cell it's actually been um, I'll give Mike the the credit here. This has been some time in the making. Um, there's. There's been a number of cells that have been constructed over the years, and basically we've created two, 
if, for lack of a better term, two, two mountains on either side. Um, what cell six does is it allows us to go in and really increase the, uh, the capacity of that landfill. The, the cell six, proposed cell six will give us 20 to 30 years uh, of, of being able to accept um, refuge, refuse at that landfill without having to go into another location. So it's, it's been a, a strategic plan that, that once we got to this point, we could open up cell six and it would give us quite a bit of, of years of, of being able to accept uh, trash. So. so the location that we're gonna move the office and the scales to now, that'll be the location of that for at least the next 20 to 30 years, you say? That's correct. Thank you, sir. Okay, any questions? Need a motion. Madam Chairman, I move the adoption of item nine. Second. <coughs> Second all, motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I'm going to, oh, it's the public hearing time. I'm going to open the public hearing for agenda item 31, brought to us by our um, sheriff, Doug Schuster. And it's a discussion and possible action, review and discuss the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant, JAG, FY19 application and authorize the county manager to sign for the certifications and assurances by the chief executive of the applicant government form at the conclusion of that pub at the of this public hearing. You want, you want to come down and say something, Sheriff? <laughs> You're lurking outside there. I didn't even see you. <laughs> Good morning, officially, Chairman Angus, members of the board, Madam Clerk, uh, Mr. Uh, Hendricks. This is a grant that we pursue each year. This is an ongoing uh, program uh, through the Justice Division. And basically, this grant affords us an opportunity to obtain much needed safety equipment that we normally wouldn't be able to get through normal, normal budgeting process. In this particular instance, we're asking uh, for some additional safety equipment for our SWAT team. We're looking to get some uh, medical equipment, additional uh, safety equipment such as helmets and, and gear to support them. And again, this is an annual grant that we pursue and we've been very fortunate in years past. So with your approval, we can move forward on this grant. Do you get this every, most every year? We've been very successful, yes. Okay, okay, okay. further than that. Okay, any questions? Okay, this is a public hearing. So is there anyone who'd like to say something? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Thank Sheriff. Thank you very much. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now we're off to the regular agenda. Item 32 is brought to us from Tim Walsh, our Development Services Director. Discussion and possible action to approve the MOU establishing Mojave County as a cooperating agency for the purpose of preparing an environmental assessment of the mine plan of operations for the Moss Mine and setting forth the working relationship between the agencies and authorize the Chairman of the Board to sign the MOU on behalf of Mojave County. We did discuss this. Um, at, I believe our last meeting or the one before. Is there any any questions? I have a, oh, do you have a question? Oh. Um, I have a comment. Uh, at the last meeting, we talked about the impact on possible recreation trails and uh, recreational vehicles. And uh, I'm very pleased to see it's been put in into the MOU. So our uh, ATV community will be able to have a voice should they need to. But Thank right you. now they don't. But should they need to. And, and so uh, thank you. You bet. Happy to. And, and uh, just if I may add, I've been working closely with uh, Public Works and uh, the Parks Department over there. They have a, a really strong connection with that group as well. So I, I've been communicating with Hal Barton there, and he's provided me some information before we've even gotten to the discussion table with them. So I think we'll have a, a great opportunity to, to include all of that with Very them. good. It was very well done. Okay. I need a motion. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the establishment of the uh, Memorandum of Understanding with uh, Mojave County as a cooperating agency. Uh, I guess. Okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 
item 33, um, brought to us by Stephen Latosky uh, from pu our Public Works Director. Sitting as the Board of Directors for the Horizon 6 Improvement District, discussion and possible action, approve the adoption of Horizon 6 Improvement District Resolution number 2019-1 to approve the petitions for addition to Horizon 6 Improvement District located in Mojave County, Arizona, and expand boundary of the Horizon 6 Improvement District to include 18 parcels totaling 127 acres north of the district's northerly boundary at Window Rock Road in the Lake Havasu City area. And this was continued by this board from our October 17th meeting. I do have people signed up to speak to it. And uh, there's not that many. Um, but we will start with Deneen Wilhelmi. And you are in favor, speaking in, in favor. favor. OK. First thing, uh, I put in one for favor and oppose. The favor part <laughs> is that the water district is going to be put in there. They're going to connect to it. Either the board here is going to do it, or a court and a judge room. That's a given. The second part I pose is uh, some issues with where the water lines are going to be, where the booster pumps are going to be, where the water meters are going to be, PVR valves, fire hydrants, and stuff like this. Until I've asked around, and it's everything's going to be engineered, engineered. Well, how can you approve a project that ain't engineered for the second part of the phase? My issue is that uh, a safety one, the fire hydrants. Everybody knows Wind Rock is a one way in and one way out. There's no fire hydrants on the north side of Window Rock where the development's going in. There's fire hydrants on the south side of the road. But what would happen if there was a fire up there in one of these new developments, the fire truck comes up, ties into the fire main, ties into the fire uh, hydrant, strings 500 feet of hose across the road to the uh, development to the area that they got to fight, and all of a sudden, somebody up the road calls up and says, hey, I need a medical vehicle up here. He gets up there, here's the hoses across the road. How's he going to get through? Does he have the authority to tell the fire department to get your lines out of the way so I can go through? Or does the fire department say, no, you can't drive up there. Call the people up and tell them wait a half an hour. This is where my concerns is. Until these is answered, or something put on a blueprint, that's on a paper that black and white that you can see where this stuff is going. I don't see how you can approve them hooking up yet. This is what I want to see. What I look at this is that uh, you go down and buy a load of lumber, you bring it out to the job site, you tell the carpenter, okay, build me a house. We'll engineer it later on. And that's what I look at this project. And I'm concerned about the safety of the fire hydrants and where they're going to be located. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments for the speaker? Or Ms. Filatowski, was there anything you want to say in response to that that might add to the conversation? Good morning, uh, Chairman Angus, members of the board, and uh, would like to also recognize the uh, uh, significant attendance by our customers uh, with Horizon 6. Um, the Horizon 6 Improvement District uh, has uh, uh, moved forward uh, toward uh, planning for and programming uh, certain improvements to the water system with the support of the board, uh, namely uh, that it has been uh, the uh, replacement of uh, uh, five uh, PRV valves. Uh, we may do it uh, uh, more of a, a phased uh, approach given the uh, funding that we have available. See, back in 2013, in the fall of 2013, the uh, board um, at the prompt of staff, uh, considered uh, increasing the uh, operations and maintenance reserve fee uh, for the district. At that time, staff called the board's attention to uh, the fact that the cash reserves uh, for the district uh, uh, were running uh, on the level of about $55,000 or so. And uh, while our operating costs uh, were about $80,000 a year, and this is the booster station, electric, et cetera, et cetera, um, Basically, the uh, revenues that were being pulled in, which was a kind of a fixed rate uh, for many, many years, uh, just wasn't keeping up with the uh, pace of inflation and the, the expenses that were being uh, obligated to the district. And as a result, 
uh, the uh, district, uh, through its board, um, adopted a uh, increased rate uh, for maintenance and operations, one that really aligns with our expenses. And that really freed up uh, what is a separate $5.75 a month per account uh, reserve uh, payment uh, that uh, we receive uh, from the uh, district customers. And what, why, why I'm bringing this up is uh, uh, the fact that due to uh, our diligence and the board's uh, understanding and action uh, back in 2013, uh, while we were sitting at $55,000 uh, approximately, cash reserves, uh, we were able to raise uh, uh, that level to about $173,000 in just three years' time. And what was really uh, a major liability in the context of providing water services, period, to the district was the replacement of the booster station. See, the whole system was constructed back in 1984. And with regard to the fire flow, in 1984, uh, the system was engineered and constructed to provide for uh, 580 gallons per minute. Um, and uh, that is woefully short of uh, uh, what today's standards are. And we know standards you know, change over the course of time. Uh, that was uh, you know, over uh, three decades past, 35 years ago. And at the time, uh, I'm not necessarily party to what the fire flow requirement was back in 1984. but. All in all, the system was constructed with about uh, 580 gallons per minute maximum flow through two uh, booster pump stations. So we undertook with the available money that we had in order to provide for what was essentially literally on the cusp of a failing booster station, replacing that booster station with one that provided for um, redundant and uh, reliable water service delivery again, but to a point of meeting what the previous system level was. So we implemented, you know, essentially a, a complete replacement of the booster station while providing for future expansion to accommodate fire flow. Uh, that was also looked at in the booster station engineering, but quite frankly, uh, we did not have the funds available to do everything at once. We replaced like for like and actually have a much more uh, energy efficient and redundant type of motor configuration uh, for water service delivery, but we are short on the fire flow. So I just want to point that out that uh, we are working towards uh, seeing our maintenance reserves uh, uh, accumulate once again so that uh, if that improvement was uh, to be contemplated, it could be. Uh, it may be some time because we like to prioritize certain projects such as the PRV replacements that will likely come first. So it's certainly open to the district and uh, Supervisor Johnson uh, uh, in recognizing uh, he held a uh, public hearing, uh, public meeting, I'm sorry, a public meeting in July uh, subsequent to the uh, city's position on uh, fire service that um, if the uh, district uh, property owners do desire to uh, submit a petition to incur expense for specific improvements such as upgrading the booster station for uh, uh, fire flow, that's something that uh, the county uh, through its uh, board of supervisors and district board could contemplate and move forward to and we could have concurrent projects. So with uh, the latter being uh, uh, more funded by assessment. So uh, we're anxious to uh, move forward and we think we've been diligent over the years in uh, uh, monitoring the budget and uh, also making important decisions uh, when they needed to be because at the end of the day, I can uh, attest that we have had no significant uh, issues with the system in terms of any uh, outages. Uh, yes, we've had you know, the occasional uh, service line or water line break, but they've always been attended to in a timely manner. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Lutowski? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is time. Yeah. I can speak loud. Um, just a couple uh, things for uh, questions for a director. Uh, this item currently, we're just con contemplating expanding the boundary of the district. Is that correct? That is correct, County Manager. And if any improvements occur uh, to benefit that portion of the district, we would have to have a petition to incur by those receiving a benefit for those, from those improvements, is that correct? That is correct. And then we would follow that process. And any petition to incur 
for improvements that would benefit that portion of the district would necessarily have to sustain or be able to support those types of improvements without damaging the original portion of the district. Is that correct? That is correct. So what my point is, is that all this is doing is expanding the district. So that's what the board is contemplating at this time. If there are any improvements to serve that portion, we would have to have a petition to occur by those people receiving a benefit from those improvements, and those improvements would then have to be engineered at those receiving the benefits expense. And it would be the county's responsibility to ensure that those improvements, whatever is proposed, would not negatively impact the remainder of the district, or at least detract from the benefit that that district is currently getting. Thank you. That works. Anyway, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Thank you. We were just notified that we can only have four on at the same time. I wonder what that was supposed to mean back in the day. Okay. We still have people still signed up to speak to this, and speaking opposed to this is Sue Lynn Ortiz. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sue Lynn Ortiz. I live at 4036 Gold Springs Road, and thank you for being here. We didn't have to drive to Kingman today. I am opposed to Item 33. Allowing any properties into Horizon 6 District does not make any sense to me until our current issues are fixed and working correctly. And then maintaining our water system, fixing the fire hydrants that have been neglected, and mainly notifying us of what's happening. We had no idea our funds were depleted. We need to build those back up before we can do anything else or allow any other properties into our city, into our little community. So that's all I have to say, and I know that I speak for a lot of our other residents here. It's very important that the Horizon 6 residents are notified of what's going on. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lori Bevins. In favor. In favor. My name is Lori Bevins. I live at 940 Lakeside Drive. I was opposed to the annexation of the 18 parcels. At this point, I feel like I have enough information to say I am in favor, but I also have concerns. I do agree with Sue Lynn that there has not been enough communication from the board or anyone in this water improvement district. I do feel like there has been negligence. There has not been a maintenance for our valves. There are fire hydrants. We do have broken fire hydrants. We do have problems with fire flow. I do want to thank the board for getting more informed on the situation, and I do want to thank Ron Gold for meeting with us recently. But we in Horizon 6 feel like there is not enough communication. Even this meeting here, when you go to the web page on Mojave County, does not say that there is going to be a meeting on this issue in Lake Havasu and where it's at, you know, unless you search. Kelly has been updating our website for home improvement or water district improvement, but even on that page it didn't say that there was going to be a meeting today regarding this annexation. In fact, Kelly did tell us when we had a meeting with her that legally she didn't have to tell us anything because this annexation doesn't have to do with us but the people petitioning. I feel like it does have something to do with us. We do have a lot of concerns about everything that's wrong with this water district. I feel like that we were not informed three years ago or a year ago when everything was tagged out, our fire hydrants. We had a meeting in July after the IGA was agreed to. So there's a lot of things that we weren't informed of. The people in Horizon 6, or at least people I've talked to, all agree that we need better communication. We need to know what's going on with our water district. 
Um, now, Steve said something about uh, in 2013 upgrading the amount of money we were paying for maintenance, uh, but we do know there was no maintenance on the PRV valves. Uh, Mike Garman told us that. So there are questions always about, well, we're paying more money, but we're not necessarily getting the things we think we're getting. Um, I thought he just said that they upgraded the amount of money we paid, and so therefore we went from 55000 to 170000 in three years. So then I'm thinking, well, from 2016 to 2019, we only have 28000 in our account. Why is that? I Thank you very much. Next up, um, speaking in opposition, Jim Hamill. Uh, thank you all for uh, letting me speak. My name is Jim Hamill, 4039 Lakeview. Um, my questioning is, um, you know, how much water is allotted to the Horizon 6 district compared to what we're using now? Also, my concerns is, is there's a lot of development that hasn't been done in the district of vacant lots, so on and so forth. And continuing on with that, uh, as we all know, water is becoming one of the most important things that we have today. Um, in some states, it's becoming more valuable than oil, let's say. Uh, so looking to the future, does Arizona have a, a water plan which will affect us in the long run? I know there's going to be federal mandates coming down according to water. So um, is that going to affect our water district? Is there answers to that? And my big question is how much water do we really have allotted to the Horizon 6 district? I have been doing some research and according to the research I have, I have documentation if somebody would like to see it here. Uh, every person in a, in a household uses approximately 60 gallons of water per day. Now, a swimming pool takes 18,000 gallons of water to fill. And in an arid air district like we are, it can evaporate in one year 30,000 gallons of water. So now, if we're taking into the effect that we're adding on people, more <coughs> swimming pools, so on and so forth, it takes 100 gallons of water to wash one car if you do it at your home. So taking all this into effect, the possibility of adding 32 more sites to this amounts to 150, 172,800 gallons in a year of usage. Um, if later, if somebody wants my documentation, I have it for them. So my concern is, in the future, if we start getting water regulated to what we have, adding on to our system right now with more people, are we going to have the water allotted to us? Um, I come from Colorado originally. Uh, and I was a farmer, and the state of Colorado became where it was short of water. So they started shutting down wells. So I have friends that lost their whole farm, their income, because there was no water. This was a federal mandated deal. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, water is something we speak about all the time. Would anybody like to make a comment or ask any questions to the gentleman speaker? Madam Chairman, I think Mr. Latoski has the answer to the water allotment question. Let's go. Chairman Angus, some members of the board, the uh, Horizon 6 Improvement District receives an allocation of Colorado River water in the amount of 170 acre feet. This translates to about 152 gallons per day. And as it relates to the existing customers that are served uh, by the, the water system, it was estimated by an engineering analysis in 2016 with the booster station replacement, which did
did cost uh, construction wise one hundred and eighty two thousand dollars this was the subsequent drawdown on the maintenance reserves but getting back to the estimate uh, the engineers estimated that the district used at that time about 60 ga 60 thousand gallons per day uh, of water uh, so significantly less than half of the allocation now we have estimated that uh, based on the 18 uh, service connections that could be realized if the board were to approve this expansion of the district that with each allocation representing 200 gallons per minute per day per day 200 gallons per day and that's per district policy that the um, resultant uh, increase in demand would be about six percent above the 60,000 uh, gallons per day so in summary district currently uses approximately 60,000 gallons per day the system the district itself has an allocation of about 152,000 gallons per day and we're estimating about uh, a 6% increase in demand uh, should we receive over the course of time 18 requests for service connections uh, to the district and that's of course predicated on the expansion. Thank you. Thank you and I hope that answers Mr. Hamill's questions. Okay, lastly we have Mr. Dennis Roberts speaking in favor. Good morning. Thank you, supervisors, uh, everybody that showed up. I want to say that in this entire process, this group has been amazing to talk to. They've been very respectful. The questions have been wonderful. Um, I think we have, have plainly stated, as has been recanted here, that uh, we have no other agenda other than to be allowed into the system. The cost of that will be borne by us. Uh, the process of it is borne by us. And as far as fire flow and those kinds of things, those are going to be important things. We'll actually be contributing to that as we are be part of the district, but we won't actually get any benefits from that as we won't have fire protection through fire, normal fire means, uh, protection means up into this area. Not that um, there couldn't still be some engineering that, that could help with that. Like one gentleman said, fire hydrants on the right side of the road or perhaps halfway up the hill or something, I don't know. But for the most part, these are all going to be fire protected houses through uh, normal fire protection engineering means. So I don't have a whole lot more to add to that other than uh, we think we've uh, certainly met all the requirements at this point, And we would love the opportunity to engineer this and go before uh, the Public Works Department and see if we can't get this project built. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, no one else has signed up. Anyone have an urge to speak? Chairman Angus, I have a question to Mr. Lukowski. Yes. Steve, um, one of the speakers wanted to uh, deny the approval until we build up enough funds to repair the PRV valves and, and get the fire end of it uh, up to par and, and make the necessary repairs. I, I was just curious as to how long that would take if, if we did not annex as opposed to how long that might take with the annexation. Do you have an estimate on, on yes. kind of pros and cons on that? Uh, Supervisor uh, Chairman Angus, uh, Supervisor uh, Bishop, uh, staff is uh, progressing it right now in uh, retaining an engineer to uh, design uh, the uh, PRV replacement. Um, and as a, as a result of the fact that uh, the board did appropriate $28,000, which was pretty much the extent of the existing maintenance reserves, uh, that we may only undertake the one important PRV uh, replacement, and that is uh, the one uh, more in the, uh, um, I guess it would be the uh, westerly uh, end of the district, uh, nearest the booster station. That will certainly have the most profound impact. But I also want to express that uh, we've seen this unfold with the uh, district expansion to uh, uh, encompass five parcels. I think this was back in 2015, um, 2015. Uh, five parcels uh, north of uh, Window Rock Road. And, and as per the policy that the board adopted in July, uh, any and all uh, new connections uh, would have to demonstrate, uh, one, that uh, uh, there is no, uh, there is sufficient capacity of the system to serve, uh, sufficient pressures um, to, to serve. And uh, as we saw with the uh, other group of five parcels, they literally just undertook the costs themselves to upgrade uh, what was necessary, namely the service line, 
and, and petitioned it in for board uh, acceptance, uh, the uh, service line uh, or the distribution line improvements. And we may see a similar outcome unfold. So as it relates again back to your question, the PRV valves, uh, please allow that uh, the level of engineering would probably take uh, you know, uh, you know, a few months, and then uh, uh, we would public publicly procure the uh, the project and uh, provide that the bids would come in at an amount adequate for the district to take on at least part of the work. Uh, we'll move forward with the PRV. So we're still, you know, fo uh, completely focused on, uh, on on completing this here in this fiscal year, uh, FY20. But uh, it may be uh, you know, some several months out. Um, should uh, the board decide to uh, pause on this particular uh, uh, petition to expand. Okay. And then my only other comment is, you know, what Mojave County prides itself on transparency and being able to communicate with our constituents. And I'm hearing that uh, this improvement district is, it feels like they're uh, not part of the uh, communication process. Is there a way that we can improve that? Or is it just lack of understanding of where to go to get that information? Well, uh, Supervisor Bishop, and, and I really appreciate and sincerely uh, uh, thank uh, the uh, district customers. They're our customers, after all, uh, for bringing these up. Uh, the city does do all the billing, and uh, as a matter of uh, outreach, uh, it would fall uh, on Public Works to uh, provide uh, you know some uh, information, but we are readily available. Um, we have offices uh, uh, that can be contacted for information. We're always available for questions. But we did take some steps uh, coming out of the... Uh, uh, IGA renewal and especially with the, uh, the fire uh, uh, position by the county or by the city uh, that uh, we established a dedicated website which we provide more references information on the uh, system operations. Uh, um, in the case of uh, this particular item coming forward, I think we just defaulted to the uh, uh, normal uh, uh, announcement of the uh, uh, board agenda meeting uh, for this uh, item to be uh, uh, you know, known uh, that it was going to be considered. We did provide a brand new website uh, for the district customers to navigate to, and that kind of provides more reference information. And uh, we, uh, when it comes to uh, any uh, uh, real substantial impacts to the district, such as the uh, a decision, I think it was back in 2017, where the fire chief uh, did raise uh, uh, our attention to uh, the state of the hydrants. Uh, we did do a, a specific mailing out to all the district uh, residents at that time. It was just a simple uh, memo letter that uh, made the uh, uh, residents aware of the state of the uh, fire hydrants uh, as we uh, continue to work uh, uh, toward that issue. Okay, thank you very much. That's all. <coughs> Any other questions from Solitowski? Well, we do have a new public information officer. Maybe this would be a good project for him to get information out quicker um, timely and be a point of contact. Okay, so with that, what is your pleasure? Board? Whose district is this in? I believe right. Supervisor Johnson. All right. we're, we're actually, we are sitting as the directors of the wider district, so we're, it's, it's all, all of us. District. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm aware of that, but I wanted to know whose district it actually sat in. So right. it's Supervisor Johnson's district. I can take a motion from anyone. Madam Chairman. Yes. I move that item 33 be adopted. And now I need a second. I'm going to second it. Okay, let's take a roll call. Oh, okay. Supervisor Watson? <coughs> no. Supervisor Johnson? No. Supervisor Bishop? Yes. Supervisor Gould? Yes. Chairman Angus? Yes. Motion carries three to two. Okay. <clears throat> Item 34. Discussion of possible action to authorize Public Works Department organizational redesign to distribute an essential job function and subordinate staff of the eliminated engineering manager, road operations and maintenance position pertaining to supervising all aspects of tra traffic control device operation and maintenance through the Traffic Control Division of Public Works to position number 1021, engineering manager, engineering and further approved reappointing 
The engineering manager, engineering under position number 1021 to range 26, step eight, whereby this placement was paired. Um, with the October 7, 2019 road superintendent realizes overall average to highway user revenue fund 205 of 2,849 versus previous organization under an engineering manager, road operations and maintenance supervising both the road and traffic control divisions of public works. Further approve revised job description for position number 1021 to reflect supervisory responsibility for the traffic control division of Public Works in its support function to Mojave County Road and Facility Assets. This might have been a good one for, that I could have abridged, but any Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we got a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. That was a no. in favor or no? In favor. I just okay. had to turn on my mic. All right, so that passed. That's okay. First. That passed unanimously. <laughs> Okay, our uh, next was brought to us next two items from our Human Resources Director, Ken Cunningham. Discussion and possible action, approve changes to personnel policies and procedures, section 5.1, County Employee Drivers Guidelines. Do I have a motion? Discussion? Motion to approve. Thank I'll you. Second it. We have a motion second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item 36. Discussion and possible action to approve changes to personnel policies and procedures, section 5.6, employee safety and loss prevention policy. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item uh, is brought by me. Discussion and possible action changes to and a rescission of ordinance 2016-05 that created Municode and replace it with the original source ordinances passed by the supervisors just as a very short little background, when we first came into office in 2013, we found out that none of our, none of our ordinances were codified. It was very difficult for people to look them up and find out we had old ones. And so we tried to get a way to put that all together and make it easier for our uh, constituents and the residents to look up things. Unfortunately, it didn't end up the way we had planned. You know, there were some, some unintended consequences, so we decided to scrap that. And so what this does is just get rid of that ordinances that we passed back then. And But we are working towards, what? Okay, well, I'll let you talk. So I'll let, I'll let the clerk, the clerk of the court, the clerk of the board has done uh, a fantastic job in, in doing this. It's been, like I said, many years in the making. So. Jenny Anderson. Madam Chair, board members, um, we have continued this in the past. We, we chose this meeting before we knew we were having this meeting here. Um, IT has done a fabulous job of building us a system to enter ordinances into, and my office has been working on that. And right. uh, Attorney Esplin's been working very hard with reviewing some of the ordinances. However, we would like to ask for one more continuance so that when we're back in Kingman with our um, audio and busy, video, we can give a demonstration prior to asking for approval. Sounds like a plan. I'll we'll make a motion that we continue until the next meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 38, Supervisor Johnson. Discussion and possible action. Direct staff to review county procedure re regarding special use permits and come back to the board within 30 days regarding the possible waiver of special use permits. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I bring this forward because of this latest event that was scheduled for Kingman and our lack of response from the county and what it sends to the other organizations that are in the county. I can go into a deep discussion on on what the event was. I'll just try to go over the kind of the last days of it. It was this Trump stock permit and Kingman denied it, the permit two days before the event was scheduled. Uh, it had been posted on Facebook that it would be uh, now held at the Great American Pizza, which is in the county in their dirt lot the day before the event. Now, no contract was made by the organizer to Mojave County to find out if permits or anything was requ required. Uh, the county did contact the organizer to get more information on the event. The event was promoted via Facebook, via ads, was advertised as a large three-day event with congressmen, VIPs, entertainers, etc. It was picked up by major media, television, all those. So it had the potential to be a success. The organizer asked on Facebook for folks to help carpool 
with out-of-town attendees, asked for 15 RVs from locals for VIPs and entertainers. Uh, in 24 hours, there's not enough time for them to get a permit. Under our special use permit rules, the state's organ organizers need to submit all paperwork with the application at least six weeks in advance. Uh, should we advise them not to hold it? Uh, they had no insurance. They had no security. They had no signage. They had no vehicle control, no alcohol permit, no camping permit or restroom facilities, no patio extension for drinking on the property, no sign off by the sheriff, no food safety inspection. We just had a two year anniversary of Las Vegas shooting. That event had permits, had security, it had everything that was required and a tragedy still happened. While we did have employees from Public Works and the Health Department go out and check on them during the event and the organizer was told if the event was got too big they would have to get permits how would that even be possible? Are we going to stop the event and fast track some permits and all the requirements that go along with it within a few hours? My problem with how this entire event was treated on the end is one that we should have been, that we could have been liable for anything that occurred. Uh, now, if we have a club who wants to hold an event that will draw thousands, we are going to tell them, no, you have to get a permit or tell them, well, let's wait and see how many you actually how many people actually show up on the day of the event, and then we'll see if you need a permit. That was obvious. I think we need to treat everybody the same way, and I think the liability issue is, is a great concern for me. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to speak to that? Uh, I, I do have something to say. If, if I think it's a great idea to talk about that. That was, whole thing was disturbing, the way everything happened, and it started with the fairgrounds. And if we're going to talk about this, I would also, I don't know if it makes sense at the same time, I would like a report as to, because I'm getting conflicting stories of what happened that day that they were denied the permit. And um, it, was, it's, it was very disturbing. And when we found out it was going to be at the county um, without any notice, that was disturbing for the same reasons that Supervisor Johnson just said. So would that be possible to get the fairgrounds or the city of Kingman, you know, whoever was involved in that initial rejection two days before an event? which is if you wish to do that I think that's a little bit far off from the actual motion we have here today I would bring it to a different I bring it to the next agenda item so that we can properly agendize it vote on and go for it I mean you can vote vote for things related to this but I think that's just a little bit too far off I recommend bring it to the next agenda you think it's far out that we're talking about special use permits and it's special use permit mm -hmm. well you're asking for an, you're asking to determine whether Kingman did something right or not I'm not determining anything I just want to report that's all I want. I just want a report as to the, the chronological time of, of events. And this one is asking for direct staff to review county procedure regarding special use permits. So you think that would be, I don't think that's going to be sufficient enough. I would recommend you bring it back to the next agenda. Okay. Okay. So, so let's go back to this Chairman one. Angus, I, yes. I um, was made aware Saturday that there was a moonshine biker event in a remote area of Golden Valley and and it it may have had a special use permit or not but by the time I learned of it it was the weekend and staff was already gone home so I would like to see um, uh, a review of, of this ordinance so that we clearly know what needs a special use permit and what does not yes Madam Chairman, um, I, can, I certainly have the authority to ask the City of Kingman administratively uh, to provide a report and see if they would do that on my asking. And uh, then I'll distribute it uh, to the rest of the board and with the caveat that, uh, uh, that you all don't respond to that uh, okay. email. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, because I'm curious also, okay. and uh, I'll do the same thing with the fairgrounds to get their perspective so I can get that in. Uh, we don't stand on circumstance. I appreciate that. And then uh, on uh, on uh, the special use permit, you know, special use permits, my understanding is that they're approved by the board and it, it takes a process like Supervisor Johnson said. Mm -hmm. The dilemma um, that my staff has is, is we're not uh, forceful enforcement. And uh, uh, we found out, actually I found out about the event uh, from the newspaper that they were actually going to be holding that event out in Golden Valley. And so, um, uh, you know, we had a, a difficulty 
making a determination to whether it did fall under special use permit and need a permit from the county and then uh, a special use permit has to go in front of the board so it can't happen immediately like Supervisor Johnson alluded to uh, he's absolutely right uh, it put the staff in a bad situation and uh, our only recourse is to uh, put place a uh, uh, whoever is in violation of our special use permit rules and requirements put them on notice that they're in violation and uh, then there would be a process through uh, you know subsequent actions but in no way can my staff go out there and prevent somebody from violating our ordinances violating that that uh, requirement so uh, you know we we have no authority to stop anything along those lines um, and I don't think anything that we could put in place would provide administrative staff with that authority the only authority that could be placed would be with the law enforcement and uh, and that's 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 a huge leap you know that to uh, ask the sheriff to get involved and to actually forcibly stop that type of an activity anyway thank you madam all right Chairman. thank you uh, supervisor johnson i i don't really see the connection between what you're asking and that so what e what exactly would you like staff to come back with I could see them expanding it to say, you know, put some kind of a recommendation that if events are held and we know they're being held without um, proper permitting from the county, then they need to be shut down for security, not only for the liability of the county and the taxpayers, but for the people that are attending that event too. Um, didn't have that all on, on this agenda. I was just saying if, if we're going to, going to do it for one we should do it for all uh, because now that the county manager has made a statement nobody's going to apply for permit from us anymore I don't believe but uh, yeah, I, I would think that's just something we need to come back with because we do need some way to yeah. uh, stop events from coming because you know and not picking on this event but it was advertised quite a bit it had been moved I think at one time it was going to be at the bullhead field mm -hmm. office field or field, field house and, and so I just I just don't want to see us get into a, a situation where uh, there could be a shooting or anything else that, that damages our people. Right. You know, um, and and people don't understand, and well, they do. Most people do. I shouldn't say people don't understand. But when um, I heard about it and was concerned for all the reasons Supervisor Johnson said, what I was told was, well, how did people get together in the old days? Well, in the old days, people didn't sue each other and look for the deepest pockets to get money from. And that's just, that's just the fact of our lives. And um, our jobs are to protect uh, the safety, health, and welfare of our constituents. So we are where we are, um, unfortunately. But I do agree with Supervisor Johnson that we need something more than what we have. And again, now that we have a public information officer, maybe we can keep getting information. Maybe people just don't know. That they're that they need to do special things yes and madam chairman i just uh touched base with uh our attorney uh Esplin. and to accomplish what supervisor johnson i believe he's he's wanting is is we can take a look at our ordinances and uh on on that on violation of a special use permit and see if we can um, wrap a, a criminal element in, into that to where it would engage the sheriff's office to where they would have the authority to go in and shut something down first we've got to determine how we're currently doing business and what authority are, is in those ordinances but then uh, take a look uh, me working with uh, Ryan Esplin and see if we can strengthen those ordinance if necessary to where there is there, there is a, a hammer that we can go out there and shut them down and obviously we'll work with the sheriff's office also is that what you're thinking? Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So put that. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have a question for Attorney Esplin. Since we have First Amendment rights in the United States, um, where do we draw the line on a political event um, to where the government is attempting to regulate free speech? Well, I think if I get it before he does this, Ron, uh, or Supervisor Gould, I think it would be just commercial events. So if there was sales of it, then while you still have a First Amendment right, I think it's when it sales get into it, then it's more of an issue the county should have. Is it sales or admission, a price of admission? 
Well, our ordinance covers it pretty good. Let me read it just. Well, our ordinance could be in conflict with the First Amendment Man, also. Be, yeah. I'll let Ryan take that part then. The key is that we're not infringing. That we're, the key is that we're not looking at the speech itself. We're not looking at the content. Anytime we go in and say, "Okay, we're going to police the content," that's when you're going to get into First Amendment violations. When we say, "Well, we like this content, but we don't like that content," that's where you're going to say, "Well, you can't do that." You have to have you have to have ordinances that are across the board. This is how we're going to apply it to every person, and we can always, you, generally speaking, you can you can regulate time, matter, means. Uh, when it comes to safety, you can regulate that. Those are things that are oftentimes you can regulate. So you can put up restrictions and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to make sure that this is for safety and for other reasons. Whatever you say there, you can say what you want. But you can't still have those restrictions in place. Um, that's, so, I, so yes, I think we could do an ordinances in that effect. The, the other issue, though, I think that you really want to look at is not so much the First Amendment, but you also look at private property rights. Because this event, for example, was on a private uh, was on private property, sure. and so you have to look at the the person's uh, rights to private property and what they can do on their private property. That 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 then raises questions of zoning and and and, and things like that that you could do and stuff. But I don't think necessarily that it's going to be something that you're going to come down on a First Amendment violation as long as you're steering, steering away from the content. Is there a threshold? You know, if you have a dozen people on a street corner, can we regulate that? Or, well, you know, is it two dozen people on the street corner? I don't know. I think it's more, but again, it's, it's more of looking at, okay, we're regulating where people are so that, they can, so that we can provide safety, so that people are, are, aren't getting hurt, but still they can say what they want. Um, so many times if you see, you, you see big events and things, you, the, the government can still say, well, even though you're going to do a protest, you got to do it at certain locations. And th then you also look into public forum issues. There's certain forums that are more that you have more free speech rights than others. For example, a public park. You're not you're, you're going to have a difficult time saying where you can have that at in a public park because a public park is a forum that traditionally has been open to free speech and public and so on. But to do it on the grounds of uh, in front of a in front of the the city water building or the public works building. That's not a traditional public forum. That's a limited public forum, and so you can control that a little bit more. So you're going to look at the location, and that will then dictate what the size is and so on. You couldn't say, hey, in your park, you can only have 12 people, because it's a public park. That's a traditional public forum that people speak at. But when you say, hey, um, we can limit how many people we're going to have down on a highway, because a highway is not a traditional public forum. It's more for driving and other forms and things like that. We can control that and we can regulate that. Thank so you. it's really going to look at the location. Sure. sure. Thanks. Chairman Angus. Yeah. I, I would like us to be um, cautious that we don't regulate the small communities that have events. Like this weekend, I went to the Dolan Springs community event and, and then after that, the Old Miners Day event. So uh, we want to make sure that we don't over-regulate to where small communities can't have their little events that support their communities. Just as a there's, note. There's just one more thing. and If you pay money, uh, uh, yeah, a significant amount of money, is there an expectation that there will be, you know, safety and, and health? You know what I'm saying? So that, that was the first thing that came to my mind when all of this happened. So I think these are, I think I'm glad we're talking about it. We need to get it together. No. It was not free. I would make a motion and direct staff to review the county procedure regarding special use permits and appropriate um, legal action that might need to be taken and bring it back to us within 30 days. Second. Okay, got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And this is our last agenda item. Gene Bishop. Supervisor Bishop, discussion of possible action. Authorize the chairman of the board to sign letters of support to companies seeking support of their applications to the Arizona Rural Broadband Development Grant Program. Kind of connected to our first. Uh, it, it connects to uh, the um, the earlier proclamation that we voted on. But uh, I also received a letter of request from Use Network Systems asking for 
a letter of support and they're applying for this grant and uh, I asked them uh, how this money would be spent and uh, they, they told me that the amount awarded per grant is $50,000 of $3 million total pot of money allocated by the Arizona Commerce Authority. So we're going to have several companies that's going to be looking for a piece of that pot of money. So what I would like to do is have this board authorize you, the chairman, to sign various letters of support because we do want broadband to come into uh, Mojave County, especially to our rural areas in northwest Mojave County. I'll tell you any questions. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Um, Supervisor Bishop is stating that she was contacted by several. I, I was only contacted by one, um, and that was HughesNet also, and they are a broadband satellite company offered services currently in Golden Valley. Uh, well, I have no problem with the grant. In fact, I think it's probably a great idea. Our infrastructure in Mojave County is badly in need of upgrading and our residents do deserve faster speeds and more access to, to service. However, after looking over what HughesNet currently offers, uh, I'm disappointed in the company. They are offering 25 megabytes. Uh, that is not a high speed. You can get over 100 megabytes in Sudden Link and Lake Havasu. 25 is barely enough to stream Netflix. There's no way enough to power today's um, always connected smart home devices. Uh, we did, my office called try to get more information from the company, but they ignored us, and they ignored our questions when we called and just sent us the information on the grant. And I guess my problem is if these companies are contacting uh, all of the supervisors, that each supervisor uh, could decide if they want to support their application, or if we do this as a board, I would like to see the companies and some information on them before we approve the item. Right now, it doesn't specify any company on the application. And I, and I know that's hard because Supervisor Bishop doesn't have all the names. So we're leaving this item up to the direction and, and putting all the pressure on the chair to decide which companies to support. Uh, that's kind of my issue. I'd like to see this item either continued or brought back as each each applicant applies. That was all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I am a customer of that said company. I received a similar letter to what Supervisor Johnson spoke of. My reply to them was, your service is so poor that my cell phone internet service works better than, than your service. But if you can show me how this grant would improve your service to my constituents, then I would be more than happy to support your bid. I received no reply to that email. <laughs> so I cannot support a motion that would broadly give the chairman the authority to endorse that company, or I think it's a bad move to give it just blanketly give our authority over to the chairman to sign whatever comes before. I think that should be either come to the board for an individual vote or to each individual supervisor and determine whether they want to endorse that or not. Thank you. Chairman Angus, those are some really good points that, that I don't disagree with, but I think any improvement is better than no improvement. It's kind of like the county roads that are not maintained by Mojave County. I think any time we bring a road into our system, it's it's better than it was. So. So if, if uh, we want to bring each company in individually as they come along, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, maybe I can put just a little bit of clarity as I understand about these grants. The ACA is um, coming up. I just heard the number over the week of $131 million. They're giving away grants. And all the companies are at different stages of what the money, they, they can only go for the amount that they are capable of doing. So for instance, I believe MEC that we had the proclamation, they had already put fiber in the ground. They're like what they call shovel ready. So they're going for a larger grant that hopefully they'll get. As Hughes, they would go for a lower grant because of just the same sort of information. However, again, it's coming into the area and it's improving service to our citizens. And But I do agree they should come one at a time. Hey, Chairman Angus, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and make a make a motion that we approve this and and let the, the board vote it down if that's if that's what the board chooses to do. But uh, I'll make a motion that we do authorize you as the chairman to sign letters of support to companies seeking support of their application to the Arizona Rural Broadband Development Grant Program. Okay, do I have a second? Okay, we have a motion and second. Discussion. Yes, discussion. 
I just want to take a minute and remind the members that uh, Arizona Commerce Authority grant is Arizona, it, it's an Arizona grant that comes from Arizona income tax that they levy upon the people of this great state of Arizona. So this, to me, this has a little more value than a federal grant. Um, so it's not free money, and it's not free money that was taken to folks that live even closer to home. And if they, I just have a problem with them giving money to, to, to poor service, and I really would like to see a separation of government and business um, because I believe in a free market, not a manipulated market. Thank you. The only thing I'd like to add to that is there's no guarantee they're going to get it. I'm sure there's qualifications, requirements, and, you know, this is just to do a letter of support for their grant application, which is just a very common practice for any grant, federal or state. Yes. Point of clarification. Mm -hmm. I believe the motion gave you authority to sign anything right. that came before you. Right. So it's not specifically towards this particular company. That's right. So it is a blanket authorization that you can sign whatever you, that comes before you in the name of the board. Right, but it's still to the same, it's still going to be, they're just letters of support. It doesn't mean they're going to get them. I don't True. Know. Right. Okay, well, with that, we have a motion and a second. Let's do a roll call. Supervisor Watson? Yes. Supervisor Johnson? No. Supervisor Bishop? Yes. Supervisor Gould? No. Chairman Angus? Yes. Motion carries three to two. Okay, is there anything else from this board or? Motion to adjourn. Okay, so moved. Thank you all for coming. If you want to sit longer, come to one of our budget meetings. Yeah. <laughs>